Good morning once again. It's hard to believe we're already in the month of March in this year of 2021. It has really gone by fast for us anyway. I don't know about you guys, but it's hard to believe this is the first Sunday of March and um, this year is moving on. I'm glad the cold weather hopefully is behind us and we can look forward to a, a beautiful spring and then uh, move forward to the rest of the year as things start to hopefully uh, get back to a little bit of normalcy. So as we start our lesson this morning, let's start with a word of prayer. Uh, Becky and I have been out of town last week and I apologize for being gone, but we needed a little rest and relaxation. And so we got away for the weekend and we're back ready to go. And, and so as we start our, our lesson, as we continue our series, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and all of the things you've done for us and for the opportunity to come and study your word again. I just pray today, Father, as your spirit moves in the hearts of each person who listens and in my own as well as I deliver this, that your will will be done and that you uh, will open the eyes of, of not only me, but others who might uh, listen to this message. It will bring honor and glory to you. Father, your word speaks truth. And I pray today as we open your word, we will uh, just see the things you had prepared for us. There are many things going on in our life, and I pray right now during this short time, Father, that we will not worry about things around us, but focus on you and on what you have for us today. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue our study on the uh, justice and the prophets, uh, we will move into our second section. We did last two weeks ago, but our... The uh, lesson today uh, is uh, a study of, uh, will identify a corrupt and prejudiced official whose abuse of power could have resulted in the destruction of God's covenant people. Little did this individual realize that certain Jews were in position to foil this genocidal intent. Miscarriage of justice and abuse of power stirs our outrage all the more when they involved officials who have been entrusted with maintaining a just society. As we move in our second section, as I talked about a while ago, it's entitled God Promises a Just Kingdom. And two weeks ago, we looked at a just servant. And today, as you've kind of maybe gotten a clue, we're going to look at, and the title is, An Executed Scoundrel. Kind of an interesting title, Executed Scoundrel. We'll be in the book of Esther. And the story of Esther is of one of several in the Old Testament to portray the success of the Israelites living in foreign surroundings. We've talked about that for the last several weeks in this series, how they were exiled into Babylon, and now they are in uh, the Medo-Persian era empire. These accounts illustrate God's care for his covenant people. They also illustrate his resolve to use them as agents of influence even when, or especially when, they face opposition, criticism, and ill treatment. The events in the book of Esther took place, as I mentioned, in the Persian citadel of Susa during the reign of King Xerxes, also known as uh, Hazurius, in 485 to 465 B.C., and that was when the Medo-Persian Empire uh, was, was, uh, had overthrown the Babylonian Empire. And as you look at the book of Esther on a timeline that I've included on the outline, the book of Esther was written toward the end of all the books of the Bible, probably one of the very last ones out of the last four or five uh, there toward the end of the Old Testament. He figures, uh, of course, in the book of Esther, or, of course, or Esther, Esther and, and a relative Mordecai. They were part of a Jewish community that had remained in the area even after a decree in 538 B.C. allowed them to return home. And I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago when King Cyrus uh, issued the decree for the Jews to be able to go back after he had overthrown the Babylonian Empire. And you can read that in the book of Esther, chapter 1. Uh, not Esther, but Ezra, I'm sorry. Esther became queen after Vasti, the previous queen, was divorced by Xerxes. He subsequently replaced her by holding a beauty pageant, which Esther had won. Throughout the selection process, Mordecai forbade Esther from revealing her nationality 
and she complied, as you can see it in Esther chapter 2. There's no indications, though, that the king himself would have held her Jewish identity against her, but perhaps Mordecai was aware of general prejudice among the members of the royal court in the larger community. But eventually a scheme to destroy the Jews had materialized. Xerxes' highest official, Haman, had developed a fierce animosity for Mordecai. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. This resulted in Haman seeking an edict from Xerxes for the annihilation of all the Jews throughout the Persian Empire. Haman secured this edict without revealing to King Xerxes which people he had targeted for destruction. A date for their eradication was set, and the Jews found themselves in grave peril. Mordecai convinced Esther to act at the risk of her own life to save her people in Esther chapter 4. A key part of his appeal was to consider the possibility that the was at work. We'll talk more about that as well in a bit. This possibility can be seen in this question as I give you a preview of it when he says, who knows but that you are come to your royal position for such a time as this in Esther 4, 14. And Esther's subsequent response and in, in, is seen in her reply in verse 16 when she says, I will go to the king even though it's against the law and if I perish, I perish. We may all be in a situation that we may not understand why we are there. God may have us there just like Esther and has us there for a specific reason. Many times we may never know what that reason is. However, if we trust God, his plan will carry us through. But after three days of fasting, Esther went before Xerxes and received his mercy. She asked that he and Haman join her in a banquet which she would answer where she would answer the king, and that's revealed in chapter 5. When prompted at the meal to offer her petition, she requested only that they come to another banquet or a feast the next day. Esther could be made into a movie or a short series as things uh, progress forward in this uh, the book of Esther. As we look at the details of an executed scoundrel in Esther, we'll look at chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, and we'll break that down into three subgroups. The first one being the scheme revealed in verses 1 through 4. And then the second part, the culprit was is exposed in verses 5 through 8. And then finally, the scoundrel executed in verses 9 and 10. I'm going to read each section all the way through, and then we'll look at each verse. So you can kind of get the gist of each, uh, each subsection. The scheme explained in verses 1 through 4. Verse 1 says, So the king dined with Esther. And on the second day, at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Up to the half of the kingdom it shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I had found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male or female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. Verse 1, obviously, Esther invites the king and Haman uh, to come to a second banquet that they are to attend the next day at Queen Esther's request. And as we get into verse 2, on the second day of the banquet, uh, she prepared the second banquet for both the king and, and Haman as well. But little did the king and Haman know what awaits them at Queen Esther's second banquet. Esther now begins the delicate and dangerous task of accusing Haman without incriminating the king who had, after all, sealed Haman's desired decree of death for the Jews. When we read in chapter 3 the reason for this decree, after the king had granted Haman the power of being basically second in command, Haman wanted all the people to bow down to him. However, Mordecai had refused, and this infuriated Haman. And he discussed this with the king. However, Haman didn't give the king the full truth. 
He wanted to destroy all the Jews, not just Mordecai. So Haman described it as a certain group of people. After the king gave his approval, then Haman in the decree named the Jewish people. However, scripture doesn't say if the king knew that the people Haman was talking about were the Jews or not. And by this time, the king had been married to Esther for a little time. Mordecai, though, had an ace up his sleeves, and we'll discuss that in just a bit. Xerxes, once again, expresses his willingness to hear Esther's petition, having been asked to wait during the banquet of the night before, he is no doubt intensely curious about what is on Esther's mind. So he exaggerated his offer up to half of the kingdom. Now, verse 3 starts revealing the truth. In ordinary circumstances, though, Esther may have drawn out the process over more days and uh, with more banquets, but Xerxes himself may have expected the process to draw out farther, given the custom of multiple-day banquets. But for Esther and her people, time is running out. At least two months have elapsed since the king's extermination order was issued, leaving less than nine months before it's to be enacted. And you can read all those details in chapter 3. That may seem like plenty of time in a modern sense, but it's not, given the vast exp expanse of the uh, Persian Empire and the limitations of ancient methods of communication. Esther has been queen for several years at this point, so it's quite likely that she has developed a sense of when to push the king and when not to. As verse 4 really starts unfolding uh, the plot, Esther begins to expose Haman's plot to destroy the Jews. Haman must be the one to connect the dots first. Esther is a Jew. Wow. I don't think he saw that coming. Her statement, my people and I have been sold, phrased in the passive voice, avoids implicating the king. The heaping up of phrases to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated emphasizes the dire consequences of her people being sold. But she goes on in the last part of verse 4, talking about had we just been sold as slaves, uh, she would have kept her mouth closed. Oppression and slavery would still hold out the possibility for God to release his people, but death would not. Esther conveys that she has seriously weighted the situation before speaking up. She may not realize that Haman has withheld the identity of the people he has targeted for destruction. One would think that the king himself would have asked that identity. The fact that he didn't indicates his absolute trust in Haman. And since the decree has been sent all over the Persian Empire, one wonders if the king is still unaware of the identity of the group being targeted. Now, the second section really gets juicy as the culprit is exposed in verses 5 through 8. So King Asherus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? And who dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Then the king arose in his wrath with the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. In verse 8, when the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? And as the words left his mouth, or left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Getting pretty dicey here. And in verse 5, the king wants to know who is he. But some wonders why the king can apparently be so clueless. But the questions are reasonable given the facts that it's been several weeks since he has been involved in this issue of uh, sealing the decree. And second, kings are busy and therefore delegate tasks to their subordinates. And the king is just now being made aware that Esther is part of the large group. Remember how during the beauty pageant, and we mentioned earlier that Mordecai forbade Esther to reveal her nationality at that time? Well, now all of a sudden he's finding out that she's a Jew. And you can read all about that in chapter 2. Verse 
In any case, the king is still trying to put together the bigger picture. If Esther had been concerned that Xerxes would have become defensive, she is probably really, re relieved sorry, to be able to point the finger squarely and only at Haman, as we look at the first part of verse 6. She does not identify him as her personal enemy, but as an adversary and enemy. Esther has stated her concern with humility and deference following the expected protocol of the royal court. Tact is utmost importance, given that Esther is accusing the king's most trusted advisor of treachery that involves misuse of the king's own power. Tact is also important in our sticky situations as well. If we go in with guns blazing, sometimes uh, the outcome may not be what we would like. But Esther is careful to level this accusation at Haman without implicating the king himself. She goes on in the rest of uh, verse 6, or it goes on in the rest of verse 6, where Haman's reaction is like that of many who are caught in wrongdoing. And we can see that many times in our society today when our political officials and others get caught with their hand in the cookie jar, so to speak. They think they have it made up until a point, and then they get caught, and then all of a sudden things start to change. And that's basically what this story is about. His reaction is like that of many who have gotten caught in wrongdoing. His once steely exterior becomes a deer caught in the headlights look. Interpreters often identify this moment as the climax of the entire story. Haman knows he is exposed, but the only question is how the king will react. And many times we're faced in that situation after we are found out. Esther has completed her speech and speaks no further in this chapter. And in verse 7, the king, obviously, he got up and he left after he heard all of this and left the room and he was enraged. His blood boiling, the king storms out. He need hear no self-defense from Haman. The king had put the pieces together and Haman's guilt is obvious. The king's highest official has abused royal authority, though the king does not know why. Haman has had his own best interest not the king's in mind. The king's intent toward Haman are clear. And we can see that from King Solomon as he wrote in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 2. A king's wrath strikes terror like the roar of a lion. Those who anger him forfeit their lives. But Haman must do something, but he has no good option. He cannot follow the king outside, nor can he add to his guilt by running away or fleeing. He had revealed this story to his wife and his friends, and they had given him an answer in Esther chapter 6, verse 13. And very interesting when he, it, it reads like this. When Haman told his wife, Zeresha, and all his friends, everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife, Zeresha, said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. And this was before all this happened in verse in chapter 7. And these words are certainly starting to come true. The first part of verse 8, the king has returned into the room. <clears throat> Persian royal banquets involve reclining on beds like couches instead of sitting at a table. Desperate for mercy, Haman approaches the queen who is reclining on her couch to plead for his life. Her silence may have increased his desperation, for he falls onto her couch. And ironically, Haman was enraged earlier when a Jew, Mordecai, would not bow down to him, but now he will find himself at the feet of one of those same Jews. And the second part of verse 8 really gets interesting. When the king, who might have handled Haman's treachery before seeing the man on his queen couch no longer matters. The king's officials act on what they recognize as a capital offense. Can you imagine coming in and finding Haman on your wife's couch? They cover Haman's face because he is no longer worthy to see the king. It's easy to understand the outrage of the king when he thought he saw Haman attempting to assault the queen. If Haman's fate wasn't sealed before, it is now. 
And it all traced back to a personal vendetta against an honorable man, Haman's grudge against Mordecai. Let me reveal a true life story, or this one was as well, but of, of the more recent times. After serving 25 years for the murder of his wife, 57-year-old Michael Morton walked out of a Texas prison on October the 4th of 2011. He was released and officially exonerated after DNA evidence proved his innocence and pointed to the crime's true perpetrator. Investigation into the initial prosecution of the crime also revealed that the district attorney in the case had illegally concealed evidence that pointed to Mr. Morton's innocence. As a result, the district attorney spent time in jail himself and was stripped of his law license. Can you imagine that? We see injustice happening all around us today, and it's been going on for years, as we can see in the story of Esther. But as we see it in this true to life, uh, just a few years ago, the same thing happening in our country still today. Now, as we look at the third section, a scoundrel executed, we'll look at verses 9 through 10. <clears throat> now, Harboam, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the door of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him on it. In verse 10, So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. As we look at verse 9 in depth, the unit Harboanum spoke up to inform the king that Haman had erected a high structure for the humiliating execution of Mordecai. 50 cubits is about 75 feet. And the, what had happened, uh, well, let me go on and say this. Haman had left the first meal in high spirits, but after a, another confrontation with Mordecai on the way, he once again became enraged. At the suggestion of his wife and friends, he had the gallows set up, as I mentioned, 75 feet high, and reveals Haman's intent for Mordecai's demise to a brazen public display. If the king had any remaining notions of sparing Haman's life, those thoughts now leave him permanently. Because, as I mentioned earlier, Mordecai had an ace up his sleeve, and earlier uh, in, the, in the book of Esther, uh, Esther chapter 2, uh, Mordecai had saved the king's life previously, and the king is now fixing to return the favor. What had happened, Mordecai had heard about a plot against the king and revealed it to Esther as when she became queen, and she told the king, and they recorded all of this in the king's writings and mentioned Mordecai as the one who had found out this plot against him. And so now the king is about to return the favor. So they hung Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai, and as I said, the king's wrath subsided. subsided. The execution took place immediately. It wasn't drawn out. It wasn't an appeal. It just happened. For Haman to meet his end in the matter, he had set up for Mordecai is the supreme irony of the book. It is a prime example of poetic justice. Proverbs 11, verses 5 and 6 says this, the righteous of the blameless make their path straight, but the wicked are brought down by their own wickedness. The righteous of the upright delivers them, but the unfaithful are trapped by evil desires. Such an outcome points to God's work on behalf of his covenant people. God bring Haman, Haman's witness, wickedness down on his own head in the same way the Bible often declares, as we just read about in Proverbs. But it's also in the New Testament as well. And we see what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1, to 1 and 2, where he says, do not, judge or, uh, do not judge or you too will be judged. And in verse 2, and catch this part, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Pretty powerful, pretty interesting. And we can see that it came about in the life of Haman as he was about to hang Mordecai and the tables were turned and he himself was hung on the same uh, gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. King Xerxes will give to Mordecai the signet ring that he had entrusted to Haman along with the position and the authority that Haman had held. The Jews find deliverance by a second decree of the king 
in chapter 8. The Feast of Purim commemorates this deliverance each year. This celebration includes not only a meal, but also hearing the book of Esther read aloud in a synagogue and giving food and other forms of charity. As we start to bring our lesson to a close today, though the book of Esther famously does not mention God by name anywhere, its many twists and turns strongly hint at God's providential hand with his covenant people. From Esther's selection as queen, to Haman's execution, and to the Jews' deliverance, the eyes of faith clearly see these events as much more than luck or happenstance. Rather, God was at work behind the scenes. We therefore see God as a main character in the account. The actions of its human characters are of mixed quality. Xerxes consistently acted under the influence of alcohol and with a hot temper. Haman also acted in self-interest and pride. Esther and Mordecai seemed not to be resisted. Uh, Esther's participation in a contest that resulted in marriage to a pagan king. But God worked his will through all parties nonetheless. Like Esther and her relative Mordecai, we are God's imperfect servants in rectifying the wrongs in the world. But God can and does work through us nonetheless. There are two extremes to avoid, thinking that confronting evil is all up to us and thinking that confronting evil is all up to God. The proper path to take in a given situation will depend on three things, prayer, Bible study, and openness to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We must always consider the possibility that God has placed us in a circumstances for just a time as this, as we talked about a while ago. And let's read that whole little passage right there in Esther chapter 4. It says in verses 13 and 14, Mordecai sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent in this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your family, father's family, will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. How many times have we been put in a position thinking of it from human standpoint of the woes that it may have, not realizing that maybe God has put us there for a reason. And if we look at it through God's eyes, just like we did in this story of Esther, maybe we'll see a different outcome. Maybe we'll have a different attitude. But there's no guarantee that every situation in, in every incident in the lives of God's people will have a tidy ending, as in the book of Esther. Evil sometimes enjoys temporary victories. The path to triumph over evil is often unclear, recognized only in hindsight. But with Christ working in us and through us, we can live with assurance that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28. So as we bring our lesson to a close, a thought to remember is that we can apply in each situation, act justly, in every situation, just like Mordecai and Esther did in the story that we just learned about. Next week, our study will be a justice-loving God, and we'll be in the book of Isaiah. And if you have time, read chapters 61 and 62. It'll give you an idea of a justice-loving God and the plan he had for his people. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we can serve you today. We just pray, Father, that as we study your word, we will see things that happened in the past and give us indication of how we can handle situations in the present. And I pray, Father, that we will lean on you. We will study your word. We'll pray and we'll follow the direction of the Holy Spirit as you lead us day by day and in all things and in all ways. Father, thank you for loving us and for the gift of salvation through Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope you have a blessed week this week and second week of March. We will talk to you next week.